No pressure, by the way. <laughs> when you set it up like that, it seems like it's just. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, obviously, you. You know, my first meeting with with Stan, I wasn't exposed to John Carter until that. And you walk into this room, and it's it's literally floor to ceiling in preparation. Not only just the visuals that we just saw now, but just. More importantly to me was was the character of John Carter, the arc he goes through, the emotional toll and, and, and whatnot. But and then you leave completely inspired by that energy that he has from from you know from since he was eight. But and you envelop yourself with the books. But more importantly, when you get that script, it, it, it's your Bible. And um, you know it, it it's a testament to Stance in the sense of just the, how collaborative we were together, as well in shaping Carter and. Um, it's, an, it's a very empowering thing when you get a director with a vision like this, where he wants to know, you know, he wants your take on it, he wants your base as well to draw from. So from there, it was just truly empowering. What's interesting for me in this talk you're saying is that he doesn't seem to have uh, sanded off Carter's rough edges, and he's still a dark hero at heart. No, that's the most important thing to me. It's truly an origin story of like, where John is from. And uh, for, for me, it's... You know, when you're in these situations, you know, of course, obviously you can't relate to being on, a, on Mars or, or dealing with these, you know, the Tharks to Matai and, and whatnot, but it, it's, it's that, the civil war and the family and the honor of what is truly grounding with, with who John is, and that's something I, I definitely held on to throughout the whole thing. Fantastic. And again, let's come to you now. As Animation supervisor, you have quite a few challenges in this one, and one of them is to incorporate, as we saw, the onset motion capture. Mm. How difficult was that? Uh, it, was, it was pretty difficult. Um, we knew going into this movie that we were going to use motion capture and facial capture. You'd be a fool to not want to have all that data when you have Will Defoe and mm -hmm. Samantha. Um, great performances. But we also knew that the characters were an abstraction of sorts. We weren't going to go from real world to digital world. There mm -hmm. was elements of them in there in Tars, but we knew that there was some kind of interpretation that would have to happen. Mm -hmm. So we knew we'd need really talented animators to come in and work with that data as well. And probably the biggest challenge for me in setting this up from the beginning was sort of political, actually. Okay. Uh, it was convincing uh, keyframe animators that this was a good thing, that using these tools was good. There's a kind of a thing going on in the industry where motion capture gets a lot of credit for stuff, and it's a great tool and everything. But this was definitely a film where we needed really strong artists as well. and. Uh, it took a while to figure out how to, how to uh, create a bridge for the artists to willingly come over. So what we did was we, we took the tools and said, right, you guys can decide whether the, the, the capture data was appropriate or not. We even gave them their own suits. And some of the best performances that we got uh -huh. for TARS and Solo were, were a combination of using the original actor's performance and the animators going and doing their own performance and finding out what worked for the scene from that particular camera because we weren't always able to capture the performance we wanted. So they've got the set. car park at lunch or something. We had a special yeah. room. They would put this real 70s looking lycra suit on right. and, uh, and then capture stuff. But we, we chose a, a, a system and a, and a methodology where you know they were allowed to act yeah. on this film. And it really is a sort of natural progression from you know when you see the old films of Disney animators looking in mirrors. It's no different. Yeah. It's no different than taking video reference of yourself, but they could actually animate and or, sorry, act performances themselves as the characters and then drop it right into the scene and mix and match. And so it was quite a big deal for us to, to get over that. And like I said, the animators know it's a big part of our workflow. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're not threatened by it anymore, so it's going to be fantastic. Are those suits available to buy, by the way? They are very, very <laughs> expensive. In the point afterwards. Um, and so uh, now, uh, you were responsible uh, for a lot of things in this movie, but partially for the, the environments. Mm -hmm. um, now again, as we saw, uh, sets were built in Utah, but that wasn't the end of it. You actually had to expand and build cities. Oh, yeah. and, uh, quite took a while, didn't it? Yeah, it took, uh, I mean, I was, but, as, along with Eamon, about two and a half years on this film. We mm -hmm. lived and breathed it for a very long time, right from the very beginning, meeting Andrew and looking at the storyboards and uh, reading the scripts. But yeah, my, my task was, uh, you know, take this studio space in Shepparton, or, you know, a miserable November evening in, Long Cross, and can you turn that into Mars, please? And no matter how big the set that we built on on stage, mm. you know, with a cinemascope lens, so you can see for miles, and you know that's what we needed to get that big scale. Um, you know, this this movie needed to have gravitas, and um, so it's 
So my, my job was to take a, a small amount of sets that we built, replicate those you know, off into the distance, and, and get that real cinematic um, scale going. But yeah, it was quite a challenge. Um, you know, what does Mars look like? Um, uh, you know, some of the sequences, uh, you look at it very strange. I mean, we shot in Utah, yeah. um, which it was an amazing place to, to go, and I, I've never been there before. The light there. Um, the environment, the rocks, you know, the sand, the dust, all this sort of stuff. It was great being there because we yeah. noticed so much, didn't we? You know, how, how light travelled, how the dust was kicked up, you know, we took all those things back and made sure that when we had to apply it to our digital environments that we replicated all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Uh, right, let's uh, get some questions from you guys now. <coughs> if anyone's any questions for Taylor, Sue or Eamon, just put your hands up. We have Roby microphones going around and we'll try and get you as soon as we can. There's a gentleman right here in the third row. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask Sue whether or not um, she actually used the, the real geography of Mars at all as inspiration for uh, the, a, a much more fictionalised version. Yeah, um, no, good question. I, yeah, we did. I did a lot of um, research into you know, Olympus Mons, for example, you know, the, the biggest crater in the size of France. Um, uh, and uh, looked at a lot of NASA photographs. In fact, the opening shot of the movie, uh, we start in space and we travel all the way through. You can see um, the, the sort of canals of Mars, or what Edgar Rice Burroughs thought were the canals of Mars. And we travel all the way through through, through the um, clouds, right down into the landscape, and then integrated the sort of Utah landscape into that. But yeah, um, a lot of reference to it. But then again, um, you know, we needed to make sure that it fitted in with the live action stuff that we shot when we were in, in Utah. So a little bit of one and half of the other. But uh, yeah, as you will, you know, I'm sure have noticed from the film, you know, Andrew's very um, grounded into you know, making it, make it photoreal. That's the most important thing. You know, we don't want a, a sci-fi movie for a sci-fi movie's sake. It's got to feel like you're really there. Um, so live action photography and yeah, a good pinch of what Mars would really be like is just what we ended up with. I think Andrew said that this, you wanted this film to feel like a period film mm. about a place we know nothing about. <laughs> that was so. It ends. It ends up being a stylized version of Mars, but for yeah, good skies. dramatic reasons. Um, yeah. We didn't go for the sort of red sky, which you know traditionally people think of Mars would look like. In fact, a sunset on Mars would be purple. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's how we have to. It's like Star Alive here. Right. Any other questions? Thanks for that. Put your hands up. Uh, there's a gentleman in the uh, one, two, three, fifth row. There we go. Keep your hand up so we can see. Thank you. And then there's a gentleman two rows back. Hi, <coughs> sorry. Um, was the film always conceived as a 3D movie? And at what point in the production, uh, uh, kind of, let me start again. This film was always um, conceived as a 3D movie, and what considerations do you need to kind of take in order to make that happen? Um, the movie was going to be 3D. Uh, we knew pretty much um, when we started shooting that it was going to be 3D. Um, we decided not to shoot it in 3D. Uh, mostly because of the um, cinemascope lenses and that, that feel that we wanted to go, the DOP definitely wanted to shoot it for real um, in that way. Uh, we dimensionalised it afterwards, um, which uh, has been done badly in some cases in the past. <laughs> and I can tell you that this process has been done very well. It's the best work I've seen. Um, and I think uh, you'll, be, you'll be pleased with the result. Um, there are considerations, especially animation-wise, about why we would, you know, we took into account how, how the shot would be done um, yeah. and, and displacement is. Yeah, I think possible. in animation terms, it reduced the amount of uh, cheating we could do. Yeah. Uh, we like to cheat the cheaters, big cheaters, big on cheating. <laughs> uh, so we have to make sure that, you know, uh, if Taylor's in a shot and Tars was standing right next to him, he had to stand right next to him in order to cast the shadows, in order to make sure that you, when you see in 3D that they look like they're sharing the same Z space as we would call it, a depth of camera. So that presented us with uh, just. Basically, like a set of handcuffs. We can still work, but you're kind of limited in what you can do in some cases. But it kept us honest. Um, but the other thing is, if you asked Andrew about the 3D aspect of it, I think he, he would be very honest with you and tell you that he had enough on his plate with making this film, his first live action film, a very complicated film to make from a, from a visual effects standpoint. Um, and 3D was just something that you know we talked about in the beginning. Should we shoot it in stereo or do it as a post process? And he was like, you know what, I've got enough to worry about, let's do it as a cost process. So it was just something we didn't need to have to juggle. We didn't need it any more complicated than we already had it. So. Are you a fan of that 3D tanner? Yeah. I am, like, you know, when it's done right. Yeah. Absolutely. And from what I've seen, I've seen a couple other scenes as well, and I love it on this. Uh, it's, the, it's the type of 
type of movie, obviously, where it should be. And when it is that way, it's great. Were you relieved it wasn't shot in 3D, or were you slightly disappointed? Because I imagine you'd like to throw a spear at the camera or <laughs> point something at the lens. Uh, Classic. To be honest, style. it really didn't factor into my prep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, we had a guy uh, had